Hey guys, welcome to Roots and Refuge Farm. My name is Jessica Sowers, my friends call me Jess and I hope you will too. And today I am so excited to invite you along for a very, very special video. Today is my first ever intentional garden tour to shoot here at our new farm in South Carolina. We are growing in zone eight, very close to zone 7B. We moved here from central Arkansas about 10 months ago and started the process of developing this semi-raw land. We didn't have any utilities, a few rough structures and some broken down fences, mostly that we had a demo. And we started to build this farm uh, largely from scratch. Where we moved from was central Arkansas. We were zone 7B there. And I have found that the growing season here is very, very similar, almost the exact same frost dates. The only difference is it doesn't get quite as cold here in the winter as it did in Arkansas. Now, my channel actually kind of started with videos just like this. Almost four years ago, to the day exactly, I shot my first ever full garden tour where I took you on a 40 minute walk through my garden. And at that video, I remember saying, um, well, I won't bore you with all the varieties. I won't bore you with all the details. And it was just a real broad overview of the garden that I honestly shot for myself. It was something that I thought I'd love to watch in the winter because frankly, I miss my garden in the winter. I miss my garden in the off season. And I've never been super great about taking detailed notes about what was going on in the garden. I've always just pulled my phone out, made a little video. And I found myself watching those over and over in the months that I didn't have a garden. So I shot this long video. I honestly didn't think anybody was gonna watch it because I thought, who's gonna wanna watch a 40 minute video about my garden? But I was surprised that you did wanna watch it and you did wanna hear the varieties. And in fact, I wasn't alone in my total love uh, for the garden. I was wooed by the beauty of it, amazed by the process of it, and so excited to grow experiments, to grow something lovely. And I found that you were with me on that path. It was an incredible discovery. And since then, I have been shooting weekly garden tours through the gardening season. Now, last year was difficult because we moved at the end of July. So I didn't get to experience the fullness of my garden last year. And it was a really hard winter to go without a garden. I uh, went through some health issues and it was actually one of those things of really being stripped bare of uh, some things maybe you leaned on. <laughs> It was a hard, it was a hard experience, but I've got a garden again now. I've never been as appreciative for it as I am now. And I'm so excited to be shooting this video and taking you guys along on the journey. We're gonna scan here. Um, our driveway comes down here. We have a really long driveway. Um, so we, we oriented this garden around the driveway um, that will eventually be right across from our house. So uh, this was in the permaculture principle of zones. We were making this zone one, but not around the house we currently live in, but around the one we're going to. So as you can see, this stretches all the way up to where the driveway comes in. And building this garden is for us about a three year plan, I think. I think that after three seasons, this being the first season of growing in this space, I'm gonna see it look like I imagine it looking. Um, the garden that we had in Arkansas took also about three seasons to fully build. We built it in phases. And if you're trying to build a big garden, I think that's the way to go. Plan it out, don't try to do it all at once. Let it develop because you're gonna learn things each year about what you wanna do. So here where I'm standing is where the garden this season begins, but over here, all the way to this side of the driveway, um, there will be future stuff there. Um, we're planning to have an area here that's gonna be like a cut flower garden, and then over on this like downhill area where we currently have some chickens and some geese that are in sort of like a nursery pen because they just got out of the brooder. Uh, that's gonna be rows of blackberries, um, some muscadines, scupper nogs, uh, different perennial things. And I have a lot of those plants in pots already. We'll see them later on down the garden belt. That's what we call this. Uh, but we're not ready to put those in yet. So we're just keeping them in pots in the high tunnel. And I think we'll probably get a lot of that planted in the fall. We're gonna start building that soil up and working on that to put those in when, once the heat dies down a little bit. In South Carolina, 
it is hot. Actually, I think the tagline for this area, like whenever you see it on signs and stuff, it's famously hot. <laughs> so um, we're looking at our first 100 degree day of the season this week on the forecast. It's 38 Celsius. Uh, definitely hot for early June. So it's just gonna get hotter. And while we're currently watering our garden on hoses from our well, we're using sprinklers, uh, that's really not ideal for a hot and humid place. And right now we're gonna just maintain what we're working on and then we'll add all those perennial areas later on in the year when we can also get some irrigation to them. So first things first, we'll start here in the first area that I planted. We actually put in this 2,000 square foot space right here. It's a 45 by 50 um, plot where we did beds in the ground. And this was onions and garlic. Right now it's just weeds. We just harvested everything here this week. We have our window greenhouse and this, which we call the cottage garden, which is kind of just like a perennial a uh, lovely space, lots of ornamental things, some different herbs in here and things for the pollinators. But right now, this area is going to be our next order of business in the garden. Uh, we're currently working on some projects in our barn and some other stuff for the farm. But we've been waiting for these to be done to start building some raised beds here. Now, there's this really cool gardening, I guess you could say style. Um, it's called potager gardening. Um, put the spelling right here because that's a French word and I am an Arkansas girl. Uh, that is how I have heard it pronounced though. Potager gardening, it is derived from monasteries, monks that many years ago uh, basically discovered that the garden was not just good for the body, but that was good for the soul. Now the word potager just means kitchen garden. So that term in itself is not special. There are a lot of people, obviously, uh, that just call their garden their potager. But when you're talking about the style potager gardening, um, it's referencing creating a space that is both beautiful and functional. Typically, this is a space where you grow food, but it's also a space where you grow medicinal herbs and you have beautiful plants for the pollinators. And in my experience with gardening, um, it was really hard work. Gardening is, it's taxing, especially if you have lived a very suburban life where you've never done anything like this before, which was my experience. And for me, I tried to garden just efficiently, just growing um, the things that grew the most, maybe the simplest, the easiest plants to get, the easiest seeds to get. And what I found is that there was no motivation for me to work really hard to grow yellow squash and red tomatoes and just like the really basic stuff that you could go buy at the grocery store. I wanted to grow something that I couldn't buy at the grocery store. I wanted to create a space that felt like worship to me. And when I first read about potager gardening and I heard people talk about that, I was like, this, this is what I'm looking for. And this space right here is very much an ode to that. Here we have this flagstone path. Um, throughout here, I've got decorative alliums and baptisia and different colocations and alocations up by the front. I've got some black hollyhocks, which is something that I loved in my old garden. I've got echinacea and iris and lavender and bee balm. Um, all through here, there's some decorative catmint some rudbeckia, some roses. I've got a couple of different David Austin roses and other varieties. That's a gardenia bush that's gonna go in the ground. I've got my green stalks. Like, check out this celosia. It's like variegated. It came up split color. There's pink on the different leaves. Um, a lot of the varieties I had didn't do that. This one is the only one that I have that came up split color. And little things like this bring so much joy into gardening for me. Since we started to share on YouTube, um, it's brought so much opportunity for us to teach and to just spread the love of gardening, which has truly enriched my life. This space though, um, this is one of those things that I really built just for me. Now this whole garden, it's, it's very large. It grows lots and lots of food. I'm growing in multiple different styles really for the sake of being able to show you guys, hey, here's all the different styles that you could garden because my hope is is that in building this garden, it's gonna be, you know, a way through the garden gate for as many people as possible. If I were just growing with no camera, um, I might not have this big of a space. I might not grow in all of these different ways. Um, it, 
it would be more likely that I would just find the one thing that worked for me in this area that I liked best and I would just do that. But this space right here, whether there was a camera or not, would be exactly the same because this just makes my heart sing. And it's all very young right now. Um, all of these perennials were just put in this year, just like the last eight weeks. And so it, it's not like as impressive now as it will be. Eventually my hope for this space is that it's very wild. Um, things reseed, they come back year after year, they're gonna be really large. And I just imagine being able to sit down on this flagstone path and be a little hidden in this really overgrown space. And my plan for this is, is that it's going to kind of spread out this way you know, the wild perennial look and move into a raised bed garden, which will be on this side and then mirrored over on this side, which right now we have potatoes growing here. We'll get to that in a second. And I almost did not do a large raised bed garden when we moved because we have pretty good soil here. We have, um, you know, the ability to grow in the ground. And in, in my old house, uh, we, I didn't have a lot of topsoil really, had hardly any at all. It's very rocky, a lot of shale and um, here, I have probably about 12 inches of clay loam before you hit expansive clay. And so I thought, I don't need to do a raised bed garden. That's unnecessary, that's lavish and extravagant, and um, I don't really need it. But then I found myself very sad, and I realized I love that. That appeals to me. And so this garden here, this potager garden, will grow lots of vegetables, herbs, lovely things, will make a haven for the pollinators. And um, ultimately, it's gonna be a gardening style that brings joy to me and that is important when you're growing your garden it's important to uh, build a space that you want to be in now this is the most uh recent project here is this raised bed that goes around the greenhouse as you can see it's brand new uh, we actually just got this filled yesterday and so i'm going to be planting a lot of different things around here mostly will be kind of low growing maybe medium because i don't want to block a lot here but along the back side which is the north side of the greenhouse i am going to plant some roses on the corner some things that are going to grow up a little higher uh, because the sun comes up and over like this way and so planting on that back side is not going to shade things and i already have a lot of plants uh, prepared to go in here some coral bells um, called black pearl i've got some more big uh, black colocations obviously doing a lot of black around the black greenhouse that has the stained glass in it weirdly i in the past was always really drawn to super bright colors um, i still obviously like a really eclectic look we're using a lot of cedar we were able to get milled from a local mill with black metal and that's kind of where i'm going with this garden i really want it to be like this moody backdrop since we are right here in this big area uh, surrounded by so much green and so far I'm just really loving how it's turning out so this is something we're really gonna watch develop over the weekly garden tours this year because we're gonna be actively building these things and you'll see the changes week to week. At this point, I'm really just hoping to get these raised beds done maybe by the end of the summer because it is mild here in the winter and I'm thinking that I could probably, I don't know for sure, but I'll probably be able to, to plant a second wave of a lot of the warm weather stuff um, and I'm having some issues down there that I'll show you when I get down there and so I'm thinking if I could cut some tomato suckers and some different things I can probably plant some in the raised beds here as well as more squash and green beans and cucumbers that'll grow and harvest in the fall and then we'll move into some of the cold weather crops and so I can probably use this space over this winter into this fall and over this winter because our first frost date here is like November 1st so I've got a long growing season right now I'm already getting people asking hey is it too late to plant XYZ? And this is just a very common misconception in gardening is that people think that because they stop seeing the stuff for sale at the store that they've missed their chance. If you'll just look up your first frost date in the fall um, and then just Google how many days until November 1st and you'll get how many days you have left in your frost free growing season. And though it is true that in the fall when the days start shortening up and you get less daylight hours, things don't grow quite as fast. If you look at a seed packet and it says 45 days to harvest for a summer squash, you know that if you've got 60 or 70 days left in your growing season, 
go ahead and put that seed in the ground because there's a very good chance you're going to get to harvest from it. Now up here in the front, I have a couple of these metal Vigo garden beds that have uh, this purple passion asparagus in it. Uh, here's one and then there's also one right across over there. Here's a little asparagus spear that's sticking up looking how an asparagus spear does um, but I'm not harvesting these we just planted these this year obviously and you really want to give your asparagus ideally three years to get very established before you start heavily harvesting on it you can harvest a little bit during year two and three um, but in year one you really don't want to harvest anything asparagus is one of those things that I always encourage people plant this right away because though it feels like three years I don't get to harvest it for three years uh, the sooner you plant it the sooner you eat for, from it but I will also say that I experienced in putting this garden together that real analysis paralysis of like oh gosh where can I put this to be certain that it's that's gonna be okay that I'm gonna be able to leave it there because an asparagus patch once it's established you'll be harvesting from that literally like decades from now uh, it lasts for a really really long time oh sweet Maya <laughs> little darling I'm really far away. <laughs> yeah, we need to get our house built so I don't have to walk as far. <laughs> this was a journey. Thank you, my love. You're welcome. You are a sweet angel. I am a sweet angel. <laughs> <laughs> Bringing me coffee on the garden tour. Here's to old times. If I don't, then you'll pass out halfway through. <laughs> I love you. I love you. I gotta go. Milk house. And stuff. <laughs> coffee. <laughs> good. <laughs> I'm so happy. I'm just so happy to be here with you guys. I'm happy to be making this video. Um, asparagus. You get it going. You have it for a long time. And um, that's why I went ahead and put these in these metal beds because I know that they're going to last for a really long time. Um, I did use some little ones there you see that one behind me that's actually the leftover pieces because i took two of the four by eight foot kits the 10 and one kits i think it's what they're called and combined them to make these 16 foot beds for the asparagus because i knew i wanted a lot um we have a big family we have six children and um, three of which are teenagers and three of which are on their way to being that five boys and one girl and they are so hungry and so like everything I plant I can't just plant a little bit of it um, to really have enough asparagus to cook regularly for our meals I needed a lot of it with these two beds combined four by uh, 16 feet times two so um, that's a pretty substantial amount of asparagus and then we've got more in the high tunnel now right here behind me I've got a lot of potatoes. Um, this was the second thing that we planted here. I'm pretty sure, yeah, we planted these before we planted the asparagus. We put these in the ground. We started like mid-March, early March, I think, probably second week. And that was these first couple of rows. And then we waited a couple weeks and planted more, waited a couple weeks and planted more. I think we have like seven rows of potatoes here. And there are a few different varieties that we've put in the ground here. We did some different yellow ones, some red potatoes, as well as some purple potatoes. Now, when I am choosing potato varieties, I, I don't really have a favorite. Um, I'll go on, I ordered some from um, Irish Eyes Potato Company. I think that I got some at Johnny's. I got some from a place called Urban Farmer. Um, I just looked at different places and tried different varieties. I have grown potatoes from like Haas before. I've grown potatoes from local uh, feed stores. You can get seed potatoes pretty cheap, usually more basic varieties. And I've also just thrown potatoes in the ground that were from the store, um, organic varieties. Some states actually do not allow that because of the potential of spreading disease. I've only ever done it with organic potatoes, but I've also heard of a lot of people growing from potatoes that sprouted. I think anything's worth an experiment, but obviously that's a personal choice. These all were grown from bought seed potatoes. Now, as you can see here, some of these potatoes are currently flowering and the ones that we harvested had already started to die back. They flowered a couple weeks ago. Typically your potatoes are gonna flower and then you're gonna start harvesting them about two Two weeks later from this 
a row and about three quarters of a row that we harvested. We got quite a lot of potatoes. I'll put a picture up on the screen so you can see what that harvest looked like. And we harvested those pretty small because they started to die back when they were pretty small. Uh, the rest of these are not dying back yet, so I'm leaving them in the ground so they can get larger. And we'll work on those potatoes we already have harvested. But I've been known to like steal some of the new potatoes while I let the rest of them grow. And then when the tops start dying back, harvest all of them. So the way I like to plant potatoes is in sort of a modified Ruth Stout method. Ruth Stout is kind of like the mother of, she called it less work gardening or... I've heard people say lazy gardening, basically doing things in a different way to alleviate some of the work that's involved. And the way that these were planted was we just mounded up some of the soil. It was just the soil that was here, you know, broad forked and made it lighter. And then just nestled the potatoes down in and covered them with an organic straw or hay uh, we were able to get this from a local farm that doesn't spray they had this it was kind of rotten it wasn't really suited to feeding to animals uh, but we were able to get that and use it on the garden now there are different things that i see going around pinterest i actually tried this when i first grew potatoes for the first time uh, where they talk about basically planting potatoes in like a trash can or a laundry basket and then just continually mounding straw or hay on top of them or more soil or mulch or whatever um, so the plants get taller and taller and grow more and more um, that does work if you are growing um, indeterminate varieties of potatoes most potatoes that you purchase as seed potatoes are determinate varieties so it's just like with bush beans or pole beans or uh, bush or determinate tomatoes and indeterminate tomatoes potatoes have different varieties like that as well a determinate plant is one that's only going to grow so tall no matter what you do um, an indeterminate plant like with a tomato is one that will just keep growing length and length and length as long as you provide it the support and the nutrition that it needs i did try that you know build the big bins and put the potatoes in but because so many of those charts that talk about that method don't mention the whole indeterminate and determinate thing it didn't work for me um i just got a small amount of potatoes out of that bin because even though I mound it up on top at some point they just quit growing taller. So what I do here because I'm putting the potatoes essentially on top of the soil and then putting straw on top of those once they grow up some I'll mound it a couple of times and add more straw and then I just stop. Once there's enough straw to keep the weeds from going and make sure that those potatoes are protected from the light you don't want your potatoes being exposed to light they turn green and they produce actually a toxin that can upset your stomach. Um, once they're protected from the light and the weeds are suppressed, I stop mounding. But then when it's time to harvest, all you have to do is move the straw out of the way and your potatoes are all growing right there, really on top of the soil, um, right underneath that thick layer of straw. And it's much easier to harvest them. So you don't have to dig down in the compacted soil as much. Now, after the harvest of this week, I'm looking at this field going, Jessica, what did you do? That is a ton of potatoes. <laughs> I mean, I'm not upset about it. If I'm gonna have too much of something, potatoes is just a dang good thing to have your hands full of. Last night, we took some of the onions that were fresh from the garden. I diced them up um, and put them on a sheet pan with quartered potatoes uh, that came out of here. They were like, a, this variety we harvested is a good yellow variety. And uh, roasted them, coated them with lard from one of our pigs, and then salted and peppered them just good salt and pepper and put them in the oven um, on like a 400 degree oven and just you know stirred them and shook them and baked them until they kind of like crisped on the edges and the onions were getting soft it was so good I was feeling pretty good about this 2,000 square foot of potatoes then but now I look at them and I think about the boxes that are currently in the uh, you know the larder building and I'm like are we gonna do <laughs> probably what we will end up doing is canning some eating a lot fresh sharing a lot and saving seed potatoes for next year now right here I have um, an empty space I had toyed with the idea of putting in you know something right here and I actually decided to hold off when I realized how close we were to harvesting the onions and the potatoes I thought we weren't even gonna get to start on those raised beds in the potage garden until like fall but then um, these grew a lot faster here than I had anticipated. I thought they were probably going to take about another month, but when I realized we were going to be harvesting these earlier, 
I didn't plant here. Uh, because the potager garden is going to come out on this side also and come up kind of level to the other side of the asparagus bed. Uh, we are going to run a fence down alongside this garden eventually, probably once we get all of this stuff actually established. We do have deer here and I've had a lot of people ask how are you deterring deer from the garden because obviously it's wide open to like our field. Um, I saw a deer in here last night. I got home it was dark and it leaped across the field up until this point they have left the garden alone um i'm kind of flirting with fire here on not having this protected and if we were to come out one morning and see a lot of damage we would bump that up the priority list as of right now i think the fact that like our animals are right on the other side of this fence and our guardian dogs are there and i think they probably bark at them and that keeps them back and so far so good and maybe uh maybe we'll be lucky and we'll be able to get this built uh we don't want to put the fence up until we're done building because we've been using like the tractor to fill beds and different things like that to move things around and um, so yeah hopefully we'll, we'll get lucky and we'll be able to get it finished building if we were to start having issues i would probably put like an electric fence up first and hope that that was enough of a deterrent until we could finish the building and then build our permanent fence here. Fences are a great tool in establishing line and structure in a garden. Um, I love art, I appreciate art very much, and line is so important in how you lead a person's eyes, and to me, a garden is a piece of art. It is an artistic expression. So that's one of the reasons I think I like raised beds so much. It's why I like uh, rows, because I love line. And adding the fences along the driveway here, I think is really gonna do a lot to make this space, space feel enclosed, um, be able to grow things along the fences. I think it's gonna be really beautiful as well as give me the opportunity to have garden gates with lovely roses over them again. That's something I'm also looking forward to. Now right here in these rows, um, you can see these plants kind of closest to the driveway. These are very, very special plants. This is a variety of sunflower developed by my friend Sunflower Steve. It has an incredible story behind it. It's called the Van Gogh Fantasy Mix. And this is a seed that he stewarded for years and years and finally released to the public this year for the first time ever. Um, I did a podcast with him kind of telling the story of this and I got the honor of being able to grow some of Steve's flowers here in my garden. Oh, they're only about a foot tall right now. They're growing so fast. The garden has finally hit that place where I think things grow like inches every day. And these sunflowers are definitely there. You come out in the evening and you're like, you're taller than you were this morning. When you're planting anything in your garden and you're choosing your spacing, the closer together that you plant your plants, the smaller that they're gonna be. So that's why for cutting flowers, uh, people will, will sow them four to six inches apart and they'll only get so tall before they flower and the flowers won't be super big. And that's fine because if you're cutting them to put on a table, you don't want really massive flowers. But I'm kind of planning on letting these like fully ride out here in the garden, but I think I want to just let these fully go and watch their whole process uh, right here. And with the fact that they are further spaced, they'll be a lot larger. So a lot of times people will grow like those really massive sunflowers, like mammoths and titans. And I think the large, the tallest sunflower I ever had in my garden was like nearly 20 feet tall. They can be extraordinary. I've seen people that had sunflower heads that were just like massive, massive, unbelievable, manhole cover sized. And uh, those that happens when they have plenty of space. If you plant them closer together, even those large varieties, they're not gonna get that big. As you can see here on this end, these were the potatoes that were planted the most recently. So you're seeing a lot of blooms here because they're just behind the other potatoes. But as you can see, even the ones that were planted almost a month sooner the plants are all about the same height so at this point when they reach that size they really start putting their energy into the tubers and that's when you really start growing potatoes over here are sweet potato vines really starting to creep uh, this is something we're going to no notice a really marked difference in in coming weeks most of these are the Beauregard 
variety. Um, I grew that because I know it does well here in South Carolina. Some of them are purple. Um, I got those from a local friend. Uh, and actually those vines are doing better than the other ones because they did, they weren't shipped. Um, you know, a lot of times if something is shipped, it's going to knock it back just because it puts stress on the plant. Uh, however, those local varieties were literally just brought straight to me from, and never had to be out of water. So they're doing better, even though they were planted later. Brian, you can tell the difference between those and the ones that were planted, I think probably even like a couple weeks earlier. Uh, that, that's a pretty big difference. So I get asked a lot in having such a large garden. People say, how do you manage all that? How do you do all that? We actually have a full-time employee that helps with the garden. And like I said earlier, if it was just me and I was just doing this for my family, it would be different. Um, it would be smaller. It would be something that I could manage myself. This is way more garden than one person can manage. And our employee's name is Will, and he has been such a gift because he loves growing stuff as much as I do. And it's been so fun to have help, for one, because I can do this big thing that I can share with people, which is a passion of mine. I love teaching people how to grow food. I love getting to see people find victory in the garden, um, to find themselves, to find freedom in the garden. It, I, I love it as much as I love gardening. And so it's just a really cool thing to get to do this passion and that passion. And that wouldn't be possible without help. Um, it's been a growing thing as we have moved and transitioned into this new season to know that um, our culture puts a ton of pride on being self-reliant and independent. And I think there's a measure of humility that's involved in saying, I can't do everything myself. But in order to reach the greater dream, sometimes you have to let go of that control of doing everything yourself and that pride of doing everything yourself. yourself. And it has been so rewarding for me. I say all that to say, this is Will's favorite part of the garden. He loves the in-ground garden, these rows. I think it really speaks to his soil-loving permaculture heart uh, to be really building the soil up with mulch. You can see there's grass growing in here. That is pretty well to be expected. Um, this was a pasture and we have Bermuda grass, which is they call zombie grass uh, because it doesn't die. And uh, that's something that we're probably going to be battling pretty heavily for the next couple of seasons as we continue to cover and mulch and tarp in the off season um, and weed and just keep plugging away. And eventually as we really heavily mulch tarp try to kill this back eventually i do think that it will get better but um that's just part of this in-ground gardening experience is we're going to fight the weeds and ultimately um, with these heavily mulched sweet potatoes eventually the sweet potatoes will cover the ground and those weeds won't be quite as bad now down here on this end right past the sweet potatoes of the in-ground mounded garden um, are winter squash and watermelons and the pink flags are denoting where things have been re-sown. Will had some really cool seeds that are heirlooms that are native to our region here in the Midlands of South Carolina that date back like 200 years. I mean the seeds weren't 200 years old. The varieties are 200 years old. But the seeds, some of the seeds were kind of old um, in case you're new here. Uh, seed packets have expiration dates on the back. They're not actually expiration dates. They're sell-by dates because there is a law that requires seed companies to sell new seeds every year. So if they're packaged for 2022, uh, you can still grow them for years after that date. But in order to make sure that you're getting new seed, that's just a rule that exists. So so if you have seeds, uh, I've heard the coolest stories of people finding, you know, seeds in their grandfather's basement that were 30, 40 years old that they were able to grow. Luke from In My Gardener grew some like 87 year old tomato seeds or something that had been in a shadow box. And these seeds, I'm not sure how old they were, but they were not new. And some of them did not come up, but some of them did. So uh, we've got a variety of watermelon, uh, white watermelon. That's one that was one of the older ones. Uh, I also grew some like crimson sweet. I did some butternut squash, some spaghetti squash. Essentially this year, in my garden I didn't do just a ton of experimenting the South Carolina heirlooms are the only thing I think that I'm growing that I haven't grown before there might be a couple varieties if I'm remembering correctly but being that I was in a brand new place growing in some different methods that I hadn't really done before I didn't want to try new new 
varieties <laughs> because if a variety fails for me I usually like to give it a, a time or two and I wouldn't know this time if I didn't like something if it was because of the variety itself or because the area I'm growing it or how I'm growing it. So I stuck with things that I'm familiar with for the most part. Right here are some of the only things that are the exception to that rule. Obviously though the squash and melons are doing well. They're just now starting to really ramble. Um, some of the melons are really starting to spread. Uh, right past this we have where we're establishing an in-ground no-dig garden. We've got fresh pine chips in the walkways. The actual beds were created by an initial till. Uh, then we laid down a weed barrier of some contractor paper, a couple layers of that, some compost on top of that, and then wood chip mulch on top of that. And the plan with this space is to grow this. Everything that's growing in here is an annual and is frost tender. So this is gonna grow throughout the season as things begin to finish up at the end of the season into like October. Uh, we'll tear the plants out, probably cut a lot of them off at the ground, leaving the roots in the ground to break down because any or organic matter that's breaking down is building a soil. And then we'll probably add some compost to these beds, maybe add another layer of mulch onto the walkways, and then we'll just cover this whole thing over winter uh, to help suppress the weed growth and to let this soil just break down, all of the wood chips break down, and in the spring we'll uncover this and replant it. Same footprint, um, maybe adding even some more compost at that point and some more wood mulch. This, as of right now, I would say this is, I don't know, it's hard for me to say what my favorite space is. I'm just so excited to have a garden again that I just love all of it. But this has been very surprisingly enjoyable for me. I, I like this. I like the look of it. I like the order of it. And we were able to put in some of the arch trellises that we love. And I've begun personalizing this space. I really like this. And it's looking extremely promising as far as producing us a lot of food. And I'll have a killdeer bird. She's gonna shout at me the entire time that we're in here because she has a little nest with some eggs. So let's go around and talk about the different varieties we have growing in here. Here, this entire row on the end is okra. Now this uh, whole garden is about 50 feet wide, I think. And so like this row, this is a pretty long row, and there are two rows of okra going in it. So here in this row, I have uh, motherland okra, which is a variety that was introduced this year from Baker Creek from Comfort Farms, which I'm very excited about. Okinawa pink okra also one I'm really excited about, and Alabama Red, which is an old favorite for me. Here I just told you I wasn't doing a bunch of new stuff, and I'm telling you about this motherland okra. Obviously, I was wrong. Mostly, I'm doing stuff I'm familiar with. Okra is one thing I really didn't get to eat much at all of last year out of my garden, so I have not had good homegrown okra in almost two years, and I'm extremely uh, anticipating this coming up. Here, um, in these rows, I've got these walls, trellis walls of tomatoes. These are companion planted with different varieties of green beans. This is um, one of the Midlands heirlooms called Eaton. Um, on this side, we've got basil growing at the foot of all of these plants. Uh, basil is a really great companion plant to tomatoes if for no other reason, but you know basil is delicious to eat with tomatoes so I've got a lot of basil growing uh, that is kind of the smell of summer for me But even some of it I'll let go to seed which will be great for the pollinators uh, These tomatoes are tied up. They are a little mixed up like some of these are um, cherry varieties mixed up with large varieties. And you can see I've got quite a bit of fruit set going on, which is really exciting. Green beans again on this side. And most of the green beans in the garden are tried and true varieties like Kalima, um, Emirates pole beans, purple potted pole beans. I have quite a few varieties in. And I don't actually remember which is which, but I'll be able to tell you when they set their pods what they are because I'm familiar with them. And that's pretty much the layout of most of these rows. I did companion plant some borage here, as well as some peppers. Now, as we progress down the garden and get closer to this end, um, I want you to take note in my tomato plants. And then down here on the end, they look notedly different. You'll see how much smaller these are, spindly, skinny, versus these. Uh, they were planted at the exact same time. 
And actually, I had shared on a vlog that um, we were having some issues in the high tunnel. And I couldn't figure out what was different because I was like, we did everything the same. But I was wrong. Uh, when I really started thinking about it, I'm like, no, we didn't. We didn't do everything the same. We had used some purchased compost in the high tunnel as well as in the first row here in this garden and down there on the end. So the, the okra is growing in the same compost as these tomatoes, but these tomatoes look really rough. And I realized that um, there's probably something some sort of herbicide in that compost something residual uh, maybe had been sprayed on the plants before it was composted tomatoes peppers eggplants being nightshades um, they often will respond different different plant families um, they're going to respond differently to things and the okra is not struggling at all with whatever was in that compost but the tomatoes really are and sadly uh, we use that compost all through one of my high tunnels which is planted almost entirely in nightshades and they're all looking really rough and i'll show you guys in a second um, i'm kind of deciding what i'm going to do right now because I was hoping they would just pull through. A lot of people are like, well, aren't you gonna scrap that? Are you gonna eat that even if it's been exposed? To me, the food that you grew at home, even if it is maybe exposed to some sort of chemical damage, um, it's still it's still the better bet because if I purchase something at the store, even if I buy something that's labeled organic, I can't be certain that it hasn't been exposed. We live in a very toxic world. I was still planning on eating it, but as time has progressed, I'm not sure it's gonna produce very much, so we'll see. Okay guys, I just saw something and I'm so excited how serendipitous for this to be the case on our first garden tour. Um, I've been telling you about my little kill deer and her little egg nest with four eggs in it. Um, she's been sitting on it. She put it in right after we established this garden and I've been like, you know, we, she's been yelling at me the whole time. But I just looked down and we have baby birds in the garden. I'll be brief because I don't want to stress mama out too bad tiny babies. I don't want to touch them and upset her. But look how sweet. They're brand new. They must have hatched, I mean, yesterday or this morning. They're nice and fluffy, but they're still brand new babies. Well, I've gotten to say happy birthday to a lot of seedlings in my garden, but this is my very first time to say happy birthday little guys to some little baby birds. So Mama Kildeer chose my squash bed for the place of her nest, and you can see here, this is where all the summer squash is planted. Uh, now summer squash and winter squash both grow at the same time. Summer squash is harvested when the skin is still soft, so the fruit is much younger, uh, whereas winter squash you leave on the plant significantly longer. It's called winter squash not because it grows in the winter, but because it is stored over the winter because when it's left on the plant longer it grows a hard skin and uh, can be stored longer. So down in here I think I'm probably going to be harvesting my first squash uh, maybe tomorrow. I could harvest them today but they're still a little bit small and if I'm going to harvest them I'd like to have enough to actually make a meal out of it for the family uh, but I have quite a few baby squash on these plants which is very exciting on the end here I have some cosmos just added for color for the pollinators some rosemary and down on that end I've got some basil but I'm very pleased with how these plants look so far in the garden this year I haven't sprayed anything there's no organic pest control this is purely organic food that has had absolutely nothing sprayed on it by me of course like I said I, I did get some contaminated compost but you know such is life here, uh, this is a row of emirate pole beans, which got completely destroyed by something. They seem to be coming back. I'm going to leave them a little while longer and see if they make a comeback. If not, I'm going to tear those out and replant them. Um, this little plant here, which these are growing so much every day, and I'm just having to redirect them to train onto the trellis. These are... Um, Armenian long cucumbers. I've got the white variety on one side and the striped variety on another. Uh, cucumbers, which technically the Armenians, that's actually a melon, but cucumbers and melons grow these little tendrils that'll grab hold of things. As you can see right there. And all you really have to do to trellis these is, as I just did right here, kind of train them. They'll grab hold and eventually they'll take off. Maybe you have to redirect to the runners. I love growing stuff like this on vertical trellises. I pretty much exclusively use cattle panels because they're affordable where I live. I know for some people they're not, but I can get a cattle panel for, 
used to be like $20. Now it's probably more like $30 uh, because the price of everything has gone up so much. But uh, even still, when you compare to other trellises that you can buy that are specifically marketed towards gardening, that's still a better deal. And growing your plants like cucumbers and melons, some winter squash, um, pole beans, tomatoes, which of course those are not natural climbers so you do have to tie them up, uh, but using those structures to keep those up off the ground just means healthier fruit. It's visually appealing and it's easier on you to harvest because you don't have to crawl around on the ground. You can harvest everything standing up straight. Now these beds are um, largely empty. I have a lot of space that's not sown yet out here and the reason for that is succession sowing. Uh, so there are some places that I will purposefully leave empty early on in the garden so I can start putting things in. So in these places, uh, this is gonna be a good place to succession sow more summer squash. That's kind of how I fight squash bugs because they can be so difficult is that I just put new plants in in a different place every you know, three or four weeks so that I have something to fall back on if the initial plants get wiped out by bugs. This plant, this arch, is planted with tromboncino squash, which is a really, really cool long squash. It grows a lot of food. And in my experience, they're pretty uh, resistant to uh, squash bugs. That's another thing that I deal with. I've just dealt with squash bugs so badly. Oh, the little baby birds are walking. Oh, I know that's not what this video is about, but I just saw one of them walk over there. It was so cute. Here, just beyond the tromboncino squash, I've got a little cattle panel teepee made out of two little pieces of cattle panel. And growing on it, I've got cucamelons, Mexican sour gherkins. That's very thrilling. Uh, we'll have those until the end of time here now. They will reseed. Uh, some celosia, some nasturtium companion plants, a little bit of empty space here. And on this trellis, I have noodle beans, which these are natural climbers, but do have to be somewhat redirected. Usually just kind of sticking them through is enough and they'll grab hold as they are right here. Um, I'm really excited about this. Noodle beans are just so beautiful on a trellis. I've got a couple of ground cherry plants, which I'm really glad I planted these out here because the ones in the high tunnel are not looking good. I did harvest the first ground cherry the other day and gave it to Sweet Maya. Ground cherries are kind of like a cherry tomatillo. They're so sweet and tropical tasting. We love them. Also, this is another thing that will just reseed for a super long time. This is a Persian basil, which smells really nice. Basils can have just such a different flavor profile. You can have your sweeter basils, your uh, lemon and lime and uh, cinnamon basils, and they can have like different notes to them. And a lot of them have more of a like an astringent medicinal flavor. And I would say the Persian leans more in that direction. It's more herbal and less sweet. Uh, but what I like to do is grow a large variety. And I like to harvest a bunch of them, dry them, crumble them up, and mix them together and make like a five or six basil blend. It's so good and it adds lots of different flavor notes to pasta dishes and uh, sauces and different things like that. Every time I just pass by, I just want to grab a handful of it and just huff it. Here I have a couple of tomatillo plants. My friend Josefina gave me these. They're doing very well. You do need two tomatillo plants for pollination. Um, if you grow one, you'll get lots of flowers and no fruit. So those two are right next to each other. On this trellis are my beloved Kajari melons. I'm so excited to welcome them to my new farm. It's like having an old friend over. So I'm watching these flowers. No fruit setting yet, but it'll come. Here, uh, these are the silver slicer cucumbers. I've got a few plants here growing on a wall trellis and also uh, kind of setting their first flowers. We don't have any fruit yet, but we will. And behind them, I've got some zinnias here that'll fill up really nicely. In this bed, I've got some peppers. Again, I'm super glad I did that since the ones in the high tunnel aren't doing super great. I'm glad I got some out here that are doing well. Uh, here are a couple of big, lovely sunflowers. And there are two different kinds of melons on this trellis. One is the Kiku chrysanthemum melon. I cannot remember which other one I did here. I think snow leopard is what it was called. It was one that was new to me. Right here, um, these are a, like a southern pea, like a black eyed pea called chicken and dumplings that's one of those midlands heirlooms and they do they seem to be doing okay a couple of them got eaten down by something but uh, mostly they're fine and right here i've got some dahlias so i did kind of interplant flowers throughout here mostly it's food but there is a little bit of the lovely things this garden 
is actually going to be extended a little bit. There's going to be another walkway and another long bed like that okra bed. There's just enough space for that. We just ran out of the fresh pine chips for the walkway. So as soon as we can get our hands on some more materials, we'll finish expanding this and it'll go out to where the fence is. So a lot of these plants out here in the front, I've got a lot of different things here that much of this is going to go in that cottage garden as we expand it as well as being planted around the greenhouse. Um, this comfrey is going to go in the orchard once we get that under planted in the orchard. That's the coral bells I was telling you guys about, the black pearl ones. That's going to go all around the greenhouse in that bed. A lot of these things I'll just plug in as we make spaces for them. In here under the shade cloth, we emptied all the plants out that were still in the greenhouse because it was getting really hot in there, as well as all of our fruit trees and stuff that are potted up and waiting to go in the orchard. They'll just do better under the shade cloth rather than being transplanted out in the heat. Here we have some rhubarb going down the side of this uh, greenhouse. I'm not sure how well all of this is gonna do. That is definitely an experiment. Um, some of them have died back, just the heat's too much for them. But I'm hoping they'll get established and that we'll be able to harvest rhubarb in the years to come. And in the middle, we have all of the citrus plants. Um, being in zone eight, we can grow this stuff here, although it probably needs a little bit of protection during the coldest nights of our winter. So that's why it's in the high tunnel. And under planted, under all of these citrus trees are asparagus plants so um there's you can kind of see some of those starting to come up these are like kumquats key limes uh meyer lemons they're looking very good they're they're doing well and then back here in this bed i do have a couple of banana trees and the plan back here i'm going to put some ginger out here some artichokes and just kind of more unusual things Check this out. We got lots of little lime babies on this plant and there's more asparagus coming up. I'm really excited about this space because it's sort of like a bucket list garden. These are things I've always wanted to grow, but I haven't been able to. One, because citrus, you know, I couldn't grow that in Arkansas. It got too cold in the winter. With some of these things, like I might have like dabbled in them. I had a couple small plants, like I had an artichoke plant. I had a small asparagus bed, but being able to do so much more of these things is very thrilling to me. This is one of those things that's just like, what would you garden and what would you grow if you had tons of space? And that's what I'm doing here. Eventually my plan between these two high tunnels is to lay down cardboard, do a very heavy layer of mulch, and then eventually plant this with um, probably more ornamental stuff. I'll probably put different roses and maybe some hibiscus and just some beautiful things in here and do sort of like a curvy stone path that walks through it. We left this much space between these because we wanted to make sure there was plenty of space for the water to run off. If we don't plant it, if we don't heavily mulch it and plant it, we're just gonna have to mow it. So um, I would like to do that, but it's probably not gonna happen this year. Here's the other high tunnel, which is currently struggling uh, pretty good because of the compost issue that I mentioned. I'm waiting, we'll see. There's a good chance we might still get something. I have two beds that are not planted in the middle here. And I had considered doing some other things, but I'm actually now going to just sow sunflowers in those. Sunflowers are a really good thing to plant if you need to detox your soil. Um, there have been a lot of really cool studies shown that sunflowers actually pull toxins as well as even radiation um, out of soil. It's why I love sunflowers. I've got this tattoo. It's the logo of our farm. Um, sunflowers are significant to me because they are such a symbol of regeneration. And now that I have identified the fact that I do have this problem in this greenhouse i don't want to plant anything else that might struggle i am going to put sunflowers in there it'll be really pretty and my thought is um, if it does look like we need to tear this other stuff out um, sunflowers will go in we'll grow a round of those and then uh, i guess we'll just figure out what to do at that point it's really a nightmare when you get contaminated stuff that's why it's really best to ask before you put any mulch on i am usually very good about testing things um if i get hay or straw especially if i cannot really talk to the person that grew it that can tell me oh no this was absolutely not sprayed with something i will put some on a small area to make sure it's not going to damage my garden in a large way but since this soil was purchased from a place that was advertising it as organic i trusted that my bad 
and I'm not saying that company's name right now because I want to give the benefit of the doubt that maybe that's not what it is, but um, I'm starting to get emails about a lot of other people having this issue. So I'm trying to piece it together and decide what to do. I don't want to cause damage unnecessarily if I'm not sure. I don't want to make accusations unnecessarily, but I'm pretty sure that's what happened. And up here in the front, you can see the zinnias and the cucumbers are not struggling. Here I've got a holy basil plant looking really nice. This is a Cuban oregano, also looking really nice, and a little, and here, there's a little geranium plant that's looking good. The nasturtiums look good, but uh, you can see here, like here are these peppers, they grew really large and lovely, and then the tops just really started curling. And this is where I, I can't quite figure it out, because like some of the plants look fine, like this one, no stress, these no stress. So I'm wondering, were just some of the bags the issue? Because I definitely have some plants that are struggling really hard. Like you can see here, these tomatoes, this is kind of how they all look. Um, they started fine and then the top started curling. They started getting really spindly. And some are trying to set fruit, but I just don't know how they're going to be able to really um, support that with such puny growth. And I had some people tell me, oh, it's, it's fine. It's just nitrogen overgrowth. They'll come out of it. And I have seen that before when I used really fresh compost. It was just very heavy on the nitrogen. Uh, but I think there's something more serious going on here, uh, just because I've never seen such a such an extreme case. It, it is kind of a mystery to me because some of them look fine and then the ones right next to them will be obviously very seriously stunted. Um, like this ground cherry looks pretty okay. Um, that one went ahead and shriveled up and died. And then you can see what's happening here. Like some of them are just struggling so much super super stunted um foliage the eggplants here largely doing the same thing i tried watering them a lot thinking maybe it would help if there was something that could be diluted and uh, that didn't do anything there's all this damage so so i'm not really trying to make any super fast decisions in here um because we have so much space it does give us the great um luxury of being able to move slow when something like this pops up in an isolated space because we can just focus on the other parts of the garden to really get a harvest and i can let this play out now if i didn't have another space and i was dealing with this i would probably be more apt to tear this out and try to address it but um man rectifying contamination like this if it is in the soil i'd hoped at first maybe it was just drift maybe something came we live in like timber agriculture and a lot of stuff gets sprayed on this so i thought maybe this is just drift it's down here on the end maybe this took the brunt of it but then i started to consider that one row of tomatoes that looks like this and i started to think at first i thought that was because those were more shaded um but then I started to think, wait a second, no, we use those bags and we switch to a different source of compost because we ran out after that first row and this was more expensive and I found a cheaper option. Um, and I think that, I think that that was the issue. And herein lies the beauty of the garden, even when you've been doing it for a while, even when you have experienced a great deal of success, you're gonna have failures. And hopefully when you do, they're not all encompassing. Hopefully it doesn't cost you your whole harvest, but even if it does, there's always next year there's always an opportunity to grow again as long as you don't give up so we're gonna let this sit we're gonna see what happens i am gonna plant some sunflowers and see if that can help um and then we're gonna move forward however we feel is best well there we have it friends our first full long garden tour and the official kickoff of the garden tour season where I will be doing weekly-ish tours. I'm going to do my best to do them weekly. Uh, this is a really big garden and this is a really long video to shoot and edit, but hopefully we can prog we can track this process weekly uh, and post these on the weekends where you might have a little more time to be able to watch them. I hope that you learned something today. Hope you felt inspired and I'm so excited to share the process of building this garden with you over the next few years. I imagine that a few years from now, you and I can both look back on these videos and be encouraged and inspired that when you're willing to just plug away piece by piece at a vision for a thing, you can really behold the full beauty of it. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I bless you. Until next time.